Good evening. Ooh, that's I will bring this meeting to order. Um, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we'll go around the table to introduce ourselves. I'm Linda Lukowski, chair of the school committee. Brian Forgett, superintendent. Triton. I'm Nicole Stoudy. I'm Brian's assistant. I'm Jerry Lee. Could you guys make sure your mic's on? Hey, Jerry, you can have your own. Did you hit? Oh. Committee, Barry. Barney Ray Parrott, um, Select Board from Salisbury. Larry White, Riley Finance Committee. Erica Jacobson, uh, Newberry Finance Committee. Jeff Walker, Student Select Board. Michael Colburn, uh, Salisbury Select Board. Caitlin Hunter, Triton Regional. And unless you're speaking, can you shut your mic off or else there's too much feedback? Thank you. Um, the next item is the meeting notes for review. So if anybody would like to review those, we don't have to vote on them. But just letting you know that those were the notes from last meeting. The next item will be the general update. And I will turn that over to Brian. Thank you, Linda. So good evening, everyone. Um, I, we've kind of, this has become kind of a standing item on the agenda just to give you kind of a state of the state as far as things uh, within the district. So um, we are continuing our trajectory back to normal, whatever that word means. Um, so we have, like everywhere else, we have had our uh, battles with illness this fall, uh, although it has not been COVID. Um, we certainly have had COVID cases, but flu and RSV and strep throat, um, have been more of a challenge than COVID this year. So um, we've continued, um, that's continued to ebb and flow. The nurses have continued to be very busy um, with students in their, in their offices. Um, and there was, you know, there was one day I know at the high school where we had close to 100 students absent. Um, and I think less than a dozen of those were um, due to COVID. So um, that seems to be uh, shifting. I was uh, at a meeting and the commissioner was, uh, today talking about a conversation with the Department of Public Health, and they are seeing those numbers start to uh, trend down. They think there could be another little spike uh, later winter, early spring, uh, but that it wouldn't be as significant um, as what we saw over the, the winter so far. So um, the rest of the winter has been pretty uneventful as it has been <laughs> out in the real world with snow, and we haven't had any snow days yet. Um, I've had a little bit of impact here and there. Um, but we continue to, to work through uh, challenging post-pandemic days. Um, the struggle is real. Um, there are, our teachers are continuing to do yeoman's work uh, are on helping and working towards mitigating the impact uh, of the disruption of the two years. So um, good things are happening. If you haven't had a chance um, to be in the schools, I know you don't routinely in your roles uh, find your way into schools, but I would encourage you, if you ever have an interest, some of you do, um, get into schools, but if you have an interest, um, you can certainly reach out uh, to the building principal, or if you'd rather go through me, I can certainly sell, set something up and spend some time with you walking through schools so you can see the amazing kids and teachers in action um, that we, we talk a lot about nuts and bolts at this table, uh, but it'd be good for you to see the work that's being done within the buildings. I think the other things that I would give you updates on are officially on the agenda, so I won't talk about them now, but I don't know if there's any questions about something you may have heard of or ongoings that I can help answer, I'd be happy to do so. The next item is the landlord tenant update. I guess I shouldn't have hit mute. Um, so I, we did not put alternative assessment um, on this agenda. Um, I mentioned to you last time we were kind of taking a different approach um, on a potential 
it doesn't have any, there aren't any uh, breakthroughs that we are ready to bring back to the table yet. Um, so we'll leave that alone. So we are waiting for the Department of Ed um, at the last, the last meeting where, um, I guess that was in November, I believe, uh, I reached out to the Department of Ed uh, to share our current amendments that had to do um, strictly with the regional, I'm sorry, with the uh, landlord tenant piece. Again, there are some slight tweaks to the regional agreement. And then the big change is we agreed by the changes in the regional agreement that we would codify the arrangement in a lease agreement between the boards of uh, the select boards and the school committee. The notion being that if we wanted to change the definition of capital from 20,000 to 25,000, that left that in the hands of discussions between town finance committees and select boards and the school committee, not something where we need to go through the 18 to 24 month process of updating the regional agreement. So we were on track and I got a call from the Department of Ed um, and there are some questions about whether that's legal. So working on that, and I don't have an answer for you, but um, the, the statute um, talks about the apportionment of, apportionment of costs um, as being a requirement within the regional agreement. So I would argue that to say that we're talking about the operating budget and the capital budget as a general rule, our regional agreement does that. Their question would be, um, the language that we had proposed, um, and it, it might be that it's a, a semantics issue, um, the language we had talked about was arrangements for the use and apportionment of facilities expenses shall be governed by a mutually agreed lease agreement uh, between the school committee and the, so it, maybe it's a semantics issue of getting rid of that word apportionment, and maybe there's some other term of art <laughs> where they would say that makes perfect sense, um, but I, I was hopeful, I talked to, um, Michelle Griffin from DESE three weeks ago, and she was hoping to get back to me. I had said, if you can get back to me before five o'clock on January 26th, um, and she was hopeful, but that didn't happen. So I don't have anything new to report. Again, the goal, pretty minor changes, um, but the hope was to have that uh, back to you ASAP. So this could be on the warrants. So this could go to town meeting this year, because it doesn't, the, if it is approved at spring town meetings this year, Commissioner has until December of the year it's signed to approve, and then it doesn't take effect until the July 1st of the year following. So a Springtown meeting this year means this goes into effect July 1 of 24. So time is of the essence, and I have nothing, I do have something new to report, because it kind of took a step, slight step backwards, but I'm hopeful we'll be able to remedy that. Any questions? Can you um, speak? Did I hear correctly, and maybe I didn't hear correctly, is the talk about an alternate agreement for Triton Sussing. being rebuilt is in the lease tenant agreement? I heard that wrong, did I? Say that again, the? The alternate assessment. The alternate assessment, so that's? That's not part of the lease. No, agreement. no, totally of, separate. Two separate. Which that, I, I would want it to be. Absolutely. absolutely. Yep. So that was a piece that's not on the agenda. Um, again, there was some discussion about, we talked about kind of a fail safe, um, kind of the worst case scenario. Does it trigger something that the towns could agree on, but not, not an alternative assessment that we would have at our disposal every year. Um, so that is not something that would, we're even ready to bring back to the group now, let alone get it on a town meeting this year. So we've separated these. The town, the town of Salisbury has agreed, signaled their uh, interest in taking back the ownership of Salisbury Elementary. So in essence, that's what this does. It, it transfers the ownership of Salisbury back to Salisbury Elementary and sets up what I'm hopeful we can figure out, whether it's semantics changes, is a lease agreement with the three towns so that we can talk about uh, start to tease out what what the district universally for all three towns what does the town cover for costs and what does the district carry in our budget for costs for the operating and maintenance costs for each building each elementary building so any other questions the next item is the middle school high school campus update uh, so um, I kept throughout the process saying when this happens, not if. 
Um, unfortunately, it's turned into a, an extended win. So we were notified, I actually received a call um, early in December, I don't remember when, um, and was given the heads up that the MSBA staff was not gonna be recommending our project to be funded um, to the board, uh, the MSBA board of directors. So we received the letter that's a, um, I can get you copies, it's attached to the board, bo board docs agenda online. Um, there's nothing exciting in the letter other than to say, you weren't welcomed in. Um, so in my discussions with uh, Diane Sullivan, who is the, remember her title? She's, she's a director in the finance and the, the management side at the MSBA. Um, she was super helpful in, in talking through the reasoning why she was part of the walkthrough on the campus here uh, when they came to visit for the senior study. There were 54 applications. We were winnowed down to one of 23. Um, they did 21, it's called senior study visits, which is a walkthrough to vet the statement of interest um, to see does, the, does it match what we described in pictures and in words. Um, so based on that, um, what this came down to is the fact that um, this year they are only approving 10 projects. Um, in years past, they've um, approved on average 16 per year. There are years that it's been more closer to 20. Um, I, I don't believe historically there's been any or many years where they've um, approved as few as 10. So what this comes down to is the statutory cap for new projects that they can approve each year is $800 million. They on average uh, allocate $50 million uh, for each of those projects. Um, so historically, they've approved, again, on average over the, the history, um, 16 projects per year. You know this year, um, they going into 23, they are not opening the accelerated repair program uh, due to the fact that they need to recoup costs because all of the current projects, they call it the pipeline, so all of the current projects in the pipeline, whether just in feasibility or already um, underway, um, those projects, the costs are coming in so increased at unbelievably high at an increased level, just like everything else uh, with inflation, but public construction has seen significant increases. So um, there are projects that um, made out really well. You look at our neighbors at Pentucket, they bid that early on in, in the pandemic. Um, so they literally could not have hit it at a better time. Um, as all the work was drying up, they were awarding contracts, and so they came in under budget. Um, now most of the projects are, um, there are several districts that were making decisions to go back and revise the scope of the projects to, to reduce spending by 10% because all of their costs had, had um, inflated so high. So, so that's the, the, the reality is we weren't accepted because of the number of um, new projects welcomed in was lower than it normally would have. Off the record, um, I, I got the sense, I won't quote anyone, but I certainly got the sense that we would, have, in, a, in a typical year, in the year when Pine Grove um, was accepted back in, I guess that would have been 16, 16, 17 timeframe, it was finished in 19, so roughly 16, um, probably 15 more like, that they were one of, uh, Pine Grove was one of 98, I believe, uh, and accepted 18 or 19 projects. If it were a year like that, this project would have likely um, been accepted just based on the merits. So um, the, as the design team shared with us on that day, it's certainly a viable project. Um, they give you feedback on your statement of interest following that senior study visit. Um, as Diane and Sullivan said to me, you don't need to improve on anything. There was nothing, um, we certainly went above and beyond. We did an entire facilities assessment. Um, so we have extensive data. Um, so she said, you just need to resubmit again next year. I was reminded that it took a few tries uh, to get the Pine Grove project in, and that is typical. And when the senior study, when they came here that day, they said, just a reminder, you know, just it's it, most, most districts um, have to apply two or three times before they're accepted. So um, we were hopeful, um, and I think that it was more kind of the, the nature of the year um, that we didn't get in this year, but we're in the process of resubmitting that statement of interest now. Um, thankfully, the MSBA has, uh, 
what's the word, um, matured enough in their electronic systems where um, just earlier this week I went in and clicked a couple buttons and it brought our entire fiscal 22 or calendar 22 statement of interest into 23, so we have some tweaks to do. Um, but the recommendation was it, it certainly wasn't a lack of information or data um, or need as codified in our SOI. So we are going take two. Um, Again, the, the timeline is the, the we are submitting to the core program. The accelerated, accelerated repair was that um, it's a quicker program that does building envelope, windows, roofs, um, HVAC. Um, that is the program that's canceled for the current uh, 2023 year. We also don't qualify because in essence you have to uh, be able to certify that the rest of your building has a 25 plus year lifespan left. I think it's fair to say we can't check that box. Um, so we will, we will resubmit or are in the process of resubmitting um, the core SOI. The, uh, nothing happens until the due date, which I believe is April 14th or 15th. Um, so there's, there's no other action that happens. The committee will need to vote to submit that. Uh, and then we wait like we did last year. Um, historically, they haven't. There are two districts that were part of the 23 that were winnowed down um, that they did not have to repeat the senior study because they had visited them in the 21 cycle. So we would likely fall in that category. We wouldn't get another senior study because they've already been through um, the whole place, soup to nuts, they've seen it all. Um, so we'll resubmit, uh, the deadline is April, and then we wait to hear um, almost a year from now in December of 23. So um, the question becomes, so all those things that we keep talking about not being able to, to wait for, um, as you know, we talked about this over the past several meetings, um, and that's now happened through the adjusted fall budget, um, which became an adjusted winter budget. Um, the fiscal 23 budget reallocates um, some excess and deficiency and um, our, uh, some of our ESSER funds and uh, we have a million, 1.5 million that will shift over to stabilization. That is still the plan. Um, it, we're not planning on spending that, right? The, the focus is, or the goal is that becomes the money that would fund a feasibility study um, so that we don't have to go to the taxpayers for that feasibility study. Um, the committee has a plan to continue to start um, increasing uh, budget funds towards both a stabilization and um, an OPEB trust over the next four years, uh, ramping that up. So that's still the goal. Um, but that 1.5, it's not technically in the fund yet, but that is, tech, that is, um, that is in stabilization. Uh, our approach at this point is not to make any planned repairs or any planned improvements. Um, but it does protect us for the God forbid. If um, I don't know, some of you have experienced some of the, there's on any given rainy day, this building leaks, period. Um, there's certainly been events um, where it's been far greater than a leak uh, with some water and a puddle on the floor. So it gives us some money if there were to be some um, catastrophic failure of the section of the roof or something like that. Uh, again, we don't want to spend that money on that. We will, I, we'll do everything we can to protect it and keep that set aside. Um, for the feasibility study, hopefully a year and a half from now. Um, but in the meantime, it does give us some reserves um, to address issues if they do arise on an emergency basis. So I'll stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Brian, where does MSBA, where do they receive their money from? The MSB receives, good question, the MSB receives their money from a penny out of every dollar on the, the sales tax. So, so every dollar that's raised in the state. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they get one penny. So it's a set funding structure. Um, we have developed um, a, a letter um, through the Policy and Advocacy Subcommittee, and it was signed by um, Linda and I, um, that um, advocates increasing, two. two Three things, so that where the where the the asks. Um, number one, it's addressing that statutory cap of eight hundred million. Um, if if uh, if this year is the new norm and they can accept only ten districts per year, um, it will take one hundred and seventy 
eight, 186 years, 189? I think it was 179 years. 79. 179 years to touch all of the districts, all the schools in the entire Commonwealth, as it stands now, um, with their average of 16 per year, it will take 113 years. That's at their current before this year, um, with, a, with 16 average new projects per year, assuming $50 million, uh, $50 million grant per year, it would take 113 years. So structurally, before we even got to where we are today, the, the statutory cap um, does not allow them to achieve their mission. And I will say, right, the, in the letter we wrote, the SBAB, which is the School Building Assistance Bureau, was formerly through the Department of Education, and it was a very different, um, it was a, a less organized and efficient structure and process. Um, the Salisbury Elementary School and this campus, the last renovation in the 90s, those were both done through the SBAB. Um, they were still being audited when I was arriving here in 05, 06. Now, um, as Rowley can attest, um, there is no prepaying interest. It's literally there every month they're paying their percentage of every warrant that comes through. And in the end, you know, you bond however you see fit. So the, the entire process, soup to nuts, an incredibly well and efficiently run organization. Um, you know, this isn't a knock on the MSBA. This is a this is a request to, to say legislatively they need to lift that cap and find new funding sources to pump more money into that. Um, so that was the first ask. The second is using their, um, whatever the funds, in essence, would be ARPA funds at the state level, rather than closing down the accelerated repair program and, and rather than limiting the number of uh, programs they're going to bring in to the core program, um, to use some one-time funds to offset um, to offset the program costs increase that are that are directly impacting districts now. Um, and then that allows them to reset, use one-time funds to fill the one-time hole, and then strategic or structurally fix the problem with that statutory cap and the funding mechanism. And then the third is, the request we made was, we're reapplying this year, so let's do everything we can to get your support uh, up on uh, Beacon Hill to, to make sure that this gets passed in take two. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Just um, at our last meeting, you indicated that you had gotten a heads up that we were not accepted, uh, and you asked us not to say anything. Is it now general knowledge? It is. Yep. So as of December twenty first, the the letter that's attached on the online agenda, that is, I received that directly from the board. So just the 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 way that works is the MSBA staff make the recommendation to the MSBA board of directors, which Deb Goldberg, the state treasurer, is the chair. So it's the board action. I, I don't believe the board has ever gone against the staff recommendation, the executive director's recommendation. Um, but it wasn't official until the board voted, but that happened on December 21st. So it is unfortunately official. So we've announced it to, you know, district-wide. The next item is the FY24 budget update. I can. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to kick it over to Kyle, let him talk for a little while. Um, just a reminder of the process. So um, our process begins with, well, began way before the holidays, but it formally begins in public um, with each of the building principals and uh, the district administrators, um, technology, curriculum instruction, student services, and general district-wide operations, uh, making presentations directly to the school committee. Um, did I say technology in there too? Uh, so there's five, there's um, 10, different pre 10 different presentations, or if you will, proposals um, over the course of three nights. That was last week. Um, and the third night um, kind of put a somber mood on things as the committee um, had the information beforehand, so it was kind of a somber mood the whole week. But um, as Kyle will will give you details on, we are seeing a year of uh, pretty extraordinary increases. Um, so that's the first step is the requests. The next step is uh, the school committee will be meeting on Saturday morning um, to go through all of those requests. Um, we'll, Kyle has put together a, an extensive summary of all the requests on a single 
well, single document, I don't know how many pages it is, many, many pages, um, and the committee will have to start setting priorities. So the goal was to give you a sense of, of what's coming down the pike. Um, and then after Kyle talks about um, the, the where we are as far as costs, we'll kind of circle back and talk about um, some of the implications of the fact that the governor is new and has an extended time period um, to produce her budget, which gives us the data we need to uh, calculate your assessments. Yeah, it's over to you. Um, so as we mentioned, in the throes of the budget process right now, in terms of uh, budget drivers this year, uh, the main themes are first and foremost kind of a, that return to a traditional budgetary pat spending pattern, uh, expectations, things of that nature. Inflation, like we talk about every day, right? That's impacting nearly every category of the budgets that we have, whether it's health insurance, uh, it's liability insurance and the cost of claims, it's our supplies and contracted services. Uh, no, no category is immune to the, the high inflationary environment. Um, also, the, we're currently in negotiations with our two of our unions, or one, uh, TRTA Unit A and Unit B, Unit A being our teachers, uh, Unit B being our instructional assistants. Looking at, in particular, the uh, instructional assistants and their rates of pay comparable with competing rates of pay, uh, we, there's some work to do there. Uh, also, the out-of-district tuitions, special education costs. Uh, at a, a state level, you may have heard that there was a approved 14% increase in the rates that out-of-district placements can charge for tuitions. Uh, so that, that hits us pretty hard, as well as uh, additional placements for students in out-of-district uh, schools to the tune, I'm in the land of big numbers right now, we have some placements that are $540,000 that we're looking at. Uh, others can average around $60,000. Uh, right now, where we are in the budget process, it's we talk about this every year, it's challenging because we're in January and then we're looking towards placements for all of next year, right? So we're actively monitoring those pl placements in uh, the student services budget itself. They did a really nice job of itemi itemizing out those placements in terms of which, which placements we know for sure are gonna happen and then the, the what ifs, so to say, of the uh, potential placements. Those increase in costs for out-of-district placements are partially offset by state circuit breaker re reimbursement funds. Uh, the challenge there, though, is the, the timing difference where we spend the money, we pay for the tuitions, then the following year we're reimbursed for them. Uh, the state does have a program called Extraordinary Relief. It's a subset of the circuit breaker program where they would reimburse for costs in the current year. Uh, I have a conference call with a person at DESE tomorrow morning to, to get the specifics on the calculation of that. Uh, I do have an estimate in there right now, but uh, just to make sure there's no gray that we know exactly. If, if we do have this significant increase in costs, can we count on those funds? Otherwise, that changes, changes everything. Uh, and then I'll jump into some not into the super high level detail, but uh, a couple of different line items. But before I do, another, another challenge this year, again, every year we talk about is the flat revenues, uh, both from a chapter 70 state level. Uh, our lo local revenues or other revenues are stable, which is great. Over the last couple of years, they had, we had to peel those back a bit in terms of interest income, uh, Medicaid reimbursements, uh, which is a, a state reimbursement. Uh, for our, our therapists, the services that therapists provide, we get a, a reimbursement for those. Uh, those have stabilized and slightly ticked upwards, uh, so that's promising, but not to the tune of the increased costs that we're looking at. Uh, so that certainly presents another challenge as well. Uh, Can I just add one more piece about, um, to make sure you heard the words out of Kyle's mouth, um, we have one student that will cost close to $540,000. This student, um, as of two months ago, did not live within the district, 
moved from a neighboring district into one of the Triton towns, that cost gets picked up by us. Um, there's an April 1st law. So as of April 1st, you're responsible for the following year for any students within your district, specifically speaking with, um, with regard to special education out of district costs. So there's a variable there. Um, this, this family uh, moved in to the Triton, um, one of the Triton towns with the intention of moving back um, to where they came from. So that's a variable in that if that family does move back before April 1st, then it would not be in our budget. There's also the variable that Kyle mentioned about if that does stick past April 1st and we're covering the cost next year, could we get extraordinary relief? Um, he mentioned the fact that private uh, special education schools uh, will largely be going up 14%. That does not include our collaboratives. So we're a member of the North Shore Consortium Consortium and Crest Collaborative. Uh, roughly half of our students are in consortium collaborative programs. The other half are in um, more specialized private placements. Um, so it would be those private placements um, that would be going up 14%. There's also um, quite a big push. Um, superintendents are, are collaboratively writing a letter um, to Governor Healy about including an offset to that 14% increase for this year. Um, the the Average increase has been under 2% for over a, of the last decade for increase, approved increases in, in those out of district schools. So um, we're asking that that be offset one time in the budget with the understanding that in years following it would be offset by circuit breaker. Um, but I, in, in speaking with um, Senator Tarr and others um, as we've been meeting, I think there's a general belief that, that, that we will get some relief, whether that's through. Um, the governor including it in her initial proposal, or that is something that happens legislatively um, on either side of the house as it goes through um, the full budget process. But we're hopeful, but just the point I wanted to make is a reminder that there's a ton of <laughs> volatility within the numbers at this point in time. Um, so just as a reminder, as we continue to talk um, for the coming weeks, the school committee is roughly meeting, or is uh, essentially meeting every Wednesday from now until uh, March 15th. Uh, if you take away um, the February break, they'll be meeting every Wednesday to have a discussion, a hearing, or something around the budget. So um, those numbers will continue to refine. But um, I can say, 18th year doing this, we've never seen this kind of volatility. Ronnie. Um, first, uh, what is the circuit breaker reimbursement rate right now? Currently fully funded. Fully funded, yep. okay. So again, circuit breaker, four, it's you take four times the average per pupil foundation. No? No, that's a that was a change in Student Opportunity Act, so it's, it's roughly 37 right now, I think, Kyle. They set it at a hard number, and then they increase it by inflation now every year, but that's only been in place for the last two or three years. But it was four times foundation, and they reset that number? Yes for years prior. So it's, I mean, it's based on four times foundation. Originally, yeah. And now it goes up by inflation each year. So that's the calculation number. So it's, I think it's like 45, 46,000 this year. So every dollar over that amount, if circuit breaker is fully funded in round figures as it goes up, call it 50,000. Every dollar over 50,000, we get 75% of that back if it's fully funded. So, um, and then now there's a transportation component as well, and the governor has committed that she is gonna fully fund. That's not, she's saying that she's gonna fully fund uh, uh, special ed? C circuit break, in the, the program, right, at the 75%. So fully fund Student Opportunity Act, which added in a transportation component in, for special education transportation into the circuit breaker calculation. So yes, so this is the, right, fully funding regional transportation means that we get 100% of the cost back. I would welcome, or I, I would echo you, that's never gonna happen because Desi believes if they're fully reimbursing it, we have no years. motivation to find reasonable costs. Um, but fully funding circuit breaker is funding the 75% of all costs above that 46,000, currently $46,000 figure. Okay, and also, wasn't there an increase in the consortiums too? The boards, so there will be a, an, an increase, but that's based on um, board's decisions. So I sit on the board of the North Shore Consortium and Crest. So 
based on contracts being settled, right, and, and the general operational costs, we set the rates based on the needs of the consortium. Okay. So it's, um, I, in we've met with both of them, probably more like four, four and a half percent. Okay. So but those have ebbed and flowed, but those have historically been significantly lower than those private schools. And we're so much better, but whatever. Um, so 14% was just the privates. The consortiums are four to five percent increase. Correct. Okay. Yep. Again, and we're better, but eh. I think that's the perfect note to end on. <laughs> so all of the individual presentations are Is this on? on our website. Uh, in terms of format of those presentations, we tried to keep them relatively consistent, where it starts off with an executive summary. We talk about the level of personnel services, personnel asks. Uh, principals and directors will advocate for the needs of those personnel changes as well as advocate for the need of uh, salary and I'm sorry uh, supply and service asks as well and then at the end there's a supplement where from a, it's a pretty much a zero based budgeting perspective we'll have the detail for each line item and specifically what we spent plan on spending for those supply and service uh, budget categories when we look at level services, uh, shift the focus over to our, our district-wide operations. Uh, some, I guess use the word highlights, um, some of the individual lines there. Uh, so when we look at, to give you a feel for the figures, right, that we're looking at, uh, substitute teaching costs over the last few years have increased significantly. Uh, we've been able to, annually we budget $300,000 for that specific line item. Uh, over the last few years, we've spent closer to 400, 450. Uh, we do believe that that's gonna peel back a little bit. However, this, is, this isn't going back to 300,000. So we're, we're proposing an increase there of 100,000 uh, to match up to those expenditure levels. When we look at our facility costs, we are currently locked into our, our utility rates right now. So for uh, electricity, natural gas, oil, we, we won't be increasing at all there, which is fantastic. Uh, but we do have, because of the inflationary environment, uh, increases in our grounds maintenance contracts. Um, our supply and contracted services line items, as well as the maintenance line items because of, uh, we use this facility, for example, uh, we're proposing increasing that by $30,000, that particular line item uh, for high school maintenance because of, to address the needs, right? Uh, when we look at our uh, retirement insurance and fixed charges line item, the bulk of that is gonna be our medical in dental insurance. Uh, as part of the initial presentation that you'll see on our website, we hadn't yet received from Maya the, the rate structure for the coming year. Uh, that's established at the MMA trade show that was this past weekend. Uh, so we did receive, initially we had included a 10% estimate just as a, a worst case scenario. So that's what's on the website. However, in tomorrow's, not tomorrow, Saturday's uh, budget, documents, uh, we've revised that to 5.6% for medical, which we've been, uh, we've had confirmed, and then dental is flat, 0%. Uh, so between medical and dental, and then our, our liabilities insurance, we're looking right now, again, we'll continue to fine tune this, but about a $500,000 increase uh, for our, our insurances. And, and when we look at our, our, our general liability, right, the, the cost of uh, when we had the room that was flooded last year, that cost $85,000 to fix for one room. So this, this cost to, not only the cost to repair, but also our experience levels, because we did have two, we had the, the flooding as well as a, a boiler repair over at Salisbury Elementary uh, last year. So that plays into our, our rate increases. Did you have a question, Ronnie? Oh, sorry. Um, then we go back to the conversation about the open union negotiations right now. Uh, still, we have not settled anything. Uh, when we look at our historical uh, increases there, as well as the current environment, we've we put a placeholder there uh, for all 
we included one line item, steps and cost of living adjustments for all employees, union and non-union. Uh, we right now have a placeholder for 1.2 million. Uh, that, uh, the most significant increase out of all of our budget line items, uh, personnel. And then uh, school choice, this year, theme challenging. Uh, we have always looked to have school choice in relative equilibrium, right, where the number of students who are choosing out of district versus those coming into Triton, we try to keep those figures or those head counts pretty similar. Uh, unfortunately, this year when the rosters were finalized in late December and January, uh, the, the equilibrium has shifted to where we have more students going out than we have coming in. Uh, so because of that shortfall, we have to make that up in the budget because we, the school choice funds that we receive, we allocate costs to those. We're not receiving those funds anymore, so we, gotta sh we have to shift it over to the budget. Yep, go ahead. In that, is there a trend on the grade levels or schools impacted by that? Like where, where, where are we losing? Uh, I could share that. So part of the challenge is the large number of seniors who are falling off. We have 15, uh, 15 seniors who will be, who are on the school choice roster this year and will not be next year. Uh, we have, in terms of sending out, there are 13 students who are currently attending the uh, TECA, the online school. Uh, but I can, I can put together that information on further categorizations for you. Absolutely. So, so this is fairly, hold on, um, fairly new information. So the way this works is each town, we do our SIMS enrollment, just like every one, other one of the 351 communities in the Commonwealth. Um, and so we're, we now have the list of students we're being charged for, and we know the, stu the list of students who were, are coming in. Uh, as, as Kyle said, big shift to the Commonwealth um, uh, Virtual School in Teca Online Academy. It's also a big shift um, in the, the names we, of students we've never seen before. So if a family currently lives in Newburyport and moves uh, their whatever in high school and middle school and move over to Newbury and Newburyport accepts them on choice, they can just stay and finish out their school career in Newburyport um, and we get the bill because they're now living within the district. So um, uh, unfortunately, it's better than, hey, we know these names, they've left. It's not as much an exodus as much as it seems like families who have moved in and kids have remained in the communities. But we're, again, that's a, a fairly new list we have. So we have uh, some due diligence do, to do to figure out the why. That's understandable. I mean, mm -hmm. if you just moved into town, um, that's interesting that they count the, the what's it called, Teca? Teca. Yeah, that that hurts. And not only do they count them, but Teca gets nine thousand rather than five thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yes, it is. Um, That'd be the and words I would use that's too. That's post a post COVID reaction, mm -hmm. right? Is yeah, yeah. So, f so the superintendent of Teca. Um, not sure where he works because it's all virtual. Um, the superintendent of Teca was part of my new superintendent cohort. So it was pretty darn new six and a half years ago. And I want to say we had, at that point, we maybe had one, maybe two kiddos there. Um, and then the, the um, Commonwealth uh, virtual school was ebbing and flowing, and we have a few students there now. Um, so yeah, to have, we have, you know, five times what we had. Um, half a dozen years ago. So that is definitely new. And they've continued to increase the amount of the charge. It, t it used to not be through school choice. It used to be a separate charge. Now it's through school choice. Um, but similar to, to the fact that charter has its own calculation that's, you know, three times the cost of choice, they did give TECA a different, as well as the Commonwealth um, Virtual School. It's 8700 plus a tech fee plus something else. I think that's why that's why I'm bringing that up is that oftentimes when I hear school choice more going out, I say, is that a reflection of us, yep. right? You know, like, what do we need to do? Increase AP classes, all this other stuff that we should be paying attention to. But 
kids moving in, you can't help that. I would want my kid to go to school where they went to school too. And then this, you, that's not a reflection. That's, there's medical things, there's all a yep. bunch of other things. Yep. So it's sad because it looks like it's a reflection of us even though it's really not. Yep. Um, yeah, and there could be some. I don't want to say none of it's a reflection, right? And so we want to get that data. And, and if it is a reflection, we want to find out why. But yeah. there isn't a, a big group of people that we know the names and they're now leaving. Yeah, I just think it's uh, the deficit in school choice. And then also if there are kids that are choosing other privates, like that that's something to look at together because that would be indicative of whether or not it is something that it's based on people leaving or wanting to stay in other locations based on that, but worthy of looking. Absolutely. Yeah, and our, our, uh, the families choosing, I mean, we're in the land of private schools, right? Um, the, the percentage. Everywhere. Right. But then, right, there's the ones, the, the govs or the prep, or I mean, these names that have been around for a long time. So as our overall enrollment has shrunk, um, our percentage of students heading off to private school has largely stayed fairly stable. We always, we know we always lose a portion um, in fifth and when the prep went down to fifth grade. So when they, we know we're losing a portion um, and then from middle school to high school, uh, we've also increased the numbers. Um, uh, Whittier has increased the number of students from Triton um, that they're taking. That's good for those kids. Um, but that obviously the towns get that bill directly um, so those kids need that experience and that program. Um, I think there's others <laughs> that could use it as well. And so we would love for those numbers to go up for those students. Um, but by the same token, that means less students here and a bigger bill for our member town. So it's certainly a balance, but there, there, there haven't been swings in the, in those, um, percentages, which again, we continue to look at for sure. Yeah. And I just to. For as, just so it's clear if anybody's watching this on Recast or anywhere else, but I am a parent of one Triton student and one child that goes to private school. Yeah. Um, so that's, I just wanna make that clear that I, I'm seeing both sides of this, I'm just curious. Absolutely. I like trends, I wanna know what we are looking at and what's gonna happen when um, I no longer have kids in either. So, but yes, we definitely are one of those families that has a mix. Yeah. You are not alone. The last piece I just want to touch upon is in terms of process and next steps. So on Saturday, like Brian mentioned, I'll be putting together or have the full document that summarizes all of these requests. And then we include a prioritization of each of those individual line items as a must do uh, a cost mitigation item and then higher priority and lower priority. Uh, facilities, the facilities line item is a perfect example of how we could structure this out where the initial presentation from last week that I put together had a $130,000 estimated increase for facilities costs. But if we, if we categorize those, uh, a must do would be about 60,000, which is our contract. We've, the increase in our contract for grounds maintenance, if signed contract, we have to, have to pay those costs, right? Uh, from a cost mitigating perspective, we have about 50,000 in proposed increases for maintenance. Uh, so that will be repairing the roofs, things like that. Uh, and then a, a higher priority item within that category would be the increases in our uh, supplies and the supplies, right? So we, we adjusted each of those items for both an inflation factor as well as an increase in just generally the cost. Uh, that's, that's not a must do, but whew, sure is a high priority. Uh, so that's just how we're gonna, on Saturday, break out each one of those line items. And then, if you don't mind actually talking about the uh, min minimum local contribution. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thanks. And then the one thing I was gonna say too is, you know, Kyle talked about contracts, but because we signed the contract, we have to pay it. So these aren't things that we're just choosing to do. And um, to also reiterate, whether it's transportation, NRT is the only game in town. We could say, let's go back to Salter, but NRT I now own Salter, and it's now owned by One Beacon. Or, um, so we see the same thing with um, landscape contractors and the numbers of folks who used to come out and bid, which kept people competitive. So as, as time has gone on, um, the economy has changed. Some things like transportation have been 
getting steadily more challenging for the last 17 years. Um, whereas other, other things have in, in recent years, um, some businesses that would have been competitive previously um, aren't in business anymore. So when you minimize and reduce the number of players at the table in a public bid process, I know you all know this working with your own towns as well, when you have fewer competitors, you, they figure out how to inflate the rates and it's not collusion, it's collusion. Um, so, so that's not, it's not a matter of, um, I didn't say it out loud, did I? Did I say it? Um, it's not a matter of just assigning willy-nilly contracts and saying, oh, we have to pay it. Um, these are things like, make sure we mow the lawn. Um, and, and again, we've, we've talked about this, this is my 18th year in this office, and we've talked about wishing we could figure out how to have our own tradespeople and our own maintenance crews and vehicles, and you need a, an influx of cash to be able to start funding that. So all of our um, basic, again, cleaning and, and general maintenance is, is uh, folks we have on staff, but um, major repairs, HVAC techs, an electrician, a carpenter, a plumber, we don't have any of those on staff. Um, so. Um, when we have an issue, we call a licensed plumber or a licensed electrician. Um, we don't have vehicles to be able to, to do movement of uh, in, um, you know, equipment around um, or you know, large uh, mowers to mow the field. So those are all contracts that, um, that we have to maintain. So just wanted to say that. So now the fun part, not really. Um, the governor, a new governor has an additional six weeks um, to publish, or is it eight weeks, to publish their first budget, um, House 1 or House 2, depending on the year. Um, uh, governor, not, not Governor-elect anymore, new Governor Healy has indicated that she is going to take the full time, which is until March 1st, um, to publish her first um, full budget package. She did commit, um, Kyle mentioned the MMA annual meeting, um, where they set Maya as part, our insurer is part of the Mass Municipal Association. I know they also um, provide uh, health insurance for with Raleigh and Newbury as well. Um, um, she indicated in her address to the MMA that she will be releasing local aid figures prior to March 1st. Um, that could be February 28th. Um, but she did commit to prior to March 1st. Um, for us, it's not a joke. We joke about this all the time. We don't care about the chapter 70 figure because we know where we're gonna get, right? We're one of the majority of state or uh, districts in the state. We're gonna get our $30 minimum per pupil because the formula hasn't been fixed. Um, so that 68,000, 67,000, that's easy. We can just make that assumption. The bigger issue is in the first iteration of the budget is where DESE releases foundation enrollment and each of your member, each of our member towns, each of yours minimum required local contribution. So again, the way we assess uh, the towns, the way we divvy up our budget is each of uh, the three towns, each of you need to pay your minimum local contribution. That's a calculation that the state sets. It's many factors. Um, of which is included equalized valuation of property within your communities, as well as uh, median income, um, as well as enrollment, and many, many other little uh, tangled, um, wild calculation pieces. So um, the challenge is that we will not have those figures to create your assessments until the first iteration of the budget is released. So. Um, we uh, partnered uh, or contracted with um, MARS, which is the Mass Association of Regional Schools. This woman by the name of Julie Kelly, um, who is brilliant at this stuff um, and has dug in deep, as well as Melissa King, who formerly worked for DESE. Um, and so uh, we contracted with them for a few hours to, to do some digging and calculating uh, of what we think those figures could be. Um, I think we're, we're pretty close on foundation enrollment. Um, after now my 18th year, finally had the aha moment of figuring out why I could never figure out foundation enrollment because they had these crazy calculations. And so 
not that I could do the calculation, but I now know at least why I couldn't do the calculation. So um, pulling with Melissa and Julie, um, we're, we're pretty comfortable that our foundation enrollment increased slightly for the first time in several years. Um, unfortunately, it didn't increase equitably. Um, last year, our foundation enrollment was 2,203. This year, it's 2,224. And again, that you're not getting a piece of paper because that could fluctuate still. This is based on the, the latest and greatest potential calculation. Um, so it's an increase of 21 students. Unfortunately, the net change um, was different for each town. Newbury continues to shrink. Newbury went down 11 students. Salisbury continues to shrink. Salisbury went down five students. The town of Rowley went up 37 students. So those of you around this table who have been doing this with us for a long time, first of all, <laughs> this is the cheers and jeers moment, right? So you all know that, that every year we talk about which town's gonna get whacked. Unfortunately, it's, it's Rowley's turn this year. Um, I, Um, no, I, I mean, it's, it's actually the numbers of kids in the schools is increasing. So obviously Rowley, it, it, there are new homes. Um, Fal I always want to call it Falcon Crest, Falcon Ridge, right? Um, huge new development. Um, there's other developments going in. Um, so it's certainly, it's, it's on the horizon. I mean, Rowley's aware of this. They've been approving these, these new developments. Um, so it's not shocking, um, but it's not, it's, this is, the, the current year is the correction, last year's count was the correction for those kids coming back after the pandemic year where we were in hybrid. Um, so is there still a lingering? Perhaps some, but largely it's, um, it's the change, it's the change in an actual population. So we actually, I haven't dug into it fully yet, but um, we actually had a, an extra um, uh, demographic study done, um, McKibben and Associates. Um, so I, I have the report. I need to digest it before I bring it to the committee. Um, but largely what it's saying is we're, we're done with the shrinking. Doesn't look like we're seeing this huge dip or in, in huge increase again. Um, but we've, we're pretty much, even in Rowley, it's kind of ebbing and flowing from here. Um, so more on that once we have a good handle on it. But um, for now, I mean, I think the, the, the challenge is gonna be that right off the bat, if we just plugged those new enrollment figures with the existing minimum local contributions, we would, it's one of those years where we would take two, you know, 300,000 away from uh, <laughs> Newbury and spread it across <coughs> Rowley and Salisbury with Rowley paying the majority of it. So it's, it's gonna be a challenging year in that that is gonna have to be made up before we even talk about the impact of the increases. So, um, the second piece of this is um, we will be approving a tentative budget on February 8th. We do not anticipate that we'll have those calculations um, prior to the, to the 8th of February. Um, maybe we will. Um, the issue will be, and we have to talk about this with the committee of how they want to um, move forward with this, is we can't give you, <laughs> we can give you in the tentative budget, we can talk aggregate increase, we can talk, you know, make assess, uh, assumptions about what we're getting for chapter 70 and regional transportation and circuit breaker and all those things and winnow down what we think your aggregate assessment will be. Um, it will be very challenging and at best an educated guess of what your actual allocation of that aggregate assessment would be. Um, right off the bat, right, if we make bad assumptions and, and I should say the work we did um, to, to generate the minimum local contribution, um, there's a range of a few hundred thousand dollars between what, what they think it will be and what it potentially could be based on assumptions. Um, we know right now the state has more money in its coffers and at its disposal than they've had in a long, long time. So there could be some assumptions that change um, in, in Governor Healy's budget that could really swing those wildly. So we could have a situation where, you know, Newbury's enrollment decreased the most and Rowley went up, but other factors within that MLC calculation fluctuate and that's offset automatically just by the minimum local contribution. So um, 
I don't have an answer for you other than to say it's going to be a challenging year. Um, it looks right now, you know, looking down at the at the figures for the enrollment, that that Rowley would see the largest proportional increase based on the the swing in the um, the student enrollment. Um, but it's it's going to be it's going to be a challenge from here. So committee will meet. Uh, I was going to say tomorrow too. We have, have to still have to survive Friday. Um, the Saturday morning, give guidance. We'll bring the committee back next Wednesday night, a document to say, okay, here's what we heard, what we're talking about, including in a tentative budget. And then on the 8th of February, they'll vote that tentative budget. Again, that's the high water mark. Um, we've always said to you, we will do our best to make sure that that is the absolute worst case scenario and continue to work and refine the numbers. Uh, between this year it will be between February 8th and then the final budget will actually be voted on March 15th. Um, I'll stop there. I know there are questions. This will give someone else a little time to think of what they want to ask related to what you said. I'm kind of stuck back on. Um, I was an old fourth grade teacher, so kind of the traditional teaching realm is what I kind of believe in and vision for the future. But looking at what happened in COVID and just hearing about the online learning that could become available for people, will the traditional, you know, public school model ever be at risk to online learning? I mean, they'll, someone is going to do a study, sure, in the yeah. heck. You went straight past the easy budget discussions and right to reframing the entirety of our educational model. Thanks for keeping it light, Mr. Walker. Well, you um, know what? Let's, let's hold it for another day. Yeah, no, I'll, I mean, I'll give you my take. I think we have redefined what is capable or what is possible in a virtual learning environment. Because of COVID. You because of that. COVID, right, in the experiment. Um, I think we have learned that there are um, some but I would argue few educational experiences where we can have the same impact virtually through a screen. Um, the vast majority of education and the experiences that we provide students, it's about, it's about growth. It's not just about whether I know four plus four equals eight. Um, it's, it's about being <laughs> better humans in community with one another and relational. So I, I I don't see, I think we'll see more and more as you get older, I think at the collegiate level, you're gonna see more and more hybrid options. Um, I, I think there certainly will be experiments and studies done on virtual high schools. Um, and I think it's- it, which, would, which would be burdensome. Yeah. Which could be, right? So if it stays in the model where we talked about TECA, mm -hmm. um, that's different than us shifting. Um, Peabody actually tried this. Peabody actually offered their own virtual school post pandemic that got certified through the state. I don't know the whole process, but similar to Tekka in the Commonwealth um, virtual school, they went through the process so they could have their own virtual academy um, and keep it within the district. And they had right K through, I think they were K through 12. Um, I think there, there are certainly, there are students, there are families um, in circumstances where that makes the most sense. Um, well, I mean, what I worry about, Brian, is if they develop some of those educational capacities where, like a high school student could have a job and still go to school yep. when he came home in the evening, that would, you know, yeah. that, that's going to... Yeah, and it, right, so more and more that's happened, right? There are, there are depending, again, circumstances all over the place, uh, but depending on circumstances, um, we've provided a high school experience through an edgy or another online platform, um, working with more of a tutor than a teacher. Um, it's, it's more the, the rarity than it is the norm. I, I don't, this is Brian Forget speaking here on January 26, 2023. I don't believe it becomes the norm for students as a general rule that we expect that it's a, a remote experience. Um, I, we, we can't offer the same experience in general um, to students and families and the work that we're trying to do um, as an educational institution um, virtually. I think two years old, but I saw a study about, about that at the college level, mm -hmm. like 500,000 kids out in the West Coast, and it was about 10% could succeed at the same level or higher in a self-paced 
online environment as they could in a traditional classroom. So I mean, that number might fluctuate up or down a little bit, but like, you know, 13 going to TECA, it's 10 you know, that would be 10% of one of our high school yeah. classes. I, I would, you know, maybe 10% of a couple of classes, mm -hmm. but everybody else is gonna be getting a worse education probably. And worse, you know, human growth experience, right? It's the, right? And I think we can talk about the, the impacts on mental health that we've seen. And I think, you know, it offers another vehicle. And, you know, right now we're able to have public meetings is only through April, right? It hasn't been extended past April. But the school committee held their budget meetings last week virtually. So via Zoom, anyone could pop on from, you know, wherever they are, sitting at a basketball game or wherever they could sit and even make a public comment if they wanted to. So there's, there's, a, there's a time and a place that we didn't know existed prior to, I mean, I didn't know the word Zoom prior to March 13th of 2020, um, but I don't think it can replace. I, How do you not think effective. I feel at my age, Brian? <laughs> I'm old too, Jeff. <laughs> not, I mean, not I'm quite. old, not too. I was not calling you old. Uh. <laughs> Any other big, huge theoretical questions or easy ones about the budget? <laughs> Sorry. So as soon as we can, I mean, uh, again, we have a lot of conversations to have with the committee, but as soon as we can get you real numbers, we will do that. Maybe, maybe the governor really means it and she's gonna give us those numbers soon. Um, but we're kind of at a loss until we have those figures. Does anybody have anything else? Well, that was a lot to digest this evening. <laughs> Um, the next meeting is going to be February 9th in Newberry. That just seems like it's a quick turnaround. Will we have enough information and change by February 9th? To so you'll have a tentative budget. We will by February 9th. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So I think that's... It's in Raleigh? <coughs> Newberry. Newberry, okay. Yeah. Okay. We've completed a full trip around the sun, so we're back to Newberry. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> when it's in Raleigh, you might need to. <laughs> All right. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. I want to thank you all for coming. And have a nice evening. Good.